Greetings again to all of you that are tuning in to our uh, videos and we're focusing on relationships, personal growth and relationship growth. Uh, today I want to talk about points of relationship growth. Eight points that I want to highlight in this video today to help you grow your relationship. Yes, in this time of being locked in, sheltering in place, uh, we can grow our relationship. Now, I've had some calls from some people that are having a difficult time in this area, and that's totally understandable. When the things, when life is uncertain, when it seems like there's no end to this shut-in, which there is, uh, and I think it's going to come very quickly. Um, we're seeing good responses from people staying in, and uh, looks like the curve is flattening. But I want to give you these, and I want to talk about number, the, the first part of this is what is the glue that uh, makes a marriage work? Now, I've been working with married couples for a long time. Uh, pastoral role, marriage family and therapy, uh, counseling role, and the coaching role. And, um, and I've been married a few years myself. <laughs> so I want, to, I want to share with you some of the things that are important. Um, probably the most important thing in the, in the growth of a relationship is your level of commitment. That's extremely important in any relationship. Uh, when you're committed to the relationship, you're not looking for an exit. Uh, a committed relationship is manifested in commitment language, behavior, and attitude, which is driven by the belief we can do this. Now, most of you that listen to me know that Sharon and I have been married a long time. Um, she's sitting here in the room with me right now. She's my audience of one. In fact, she's been my audience of one for 56 years. <laughs> she heard me speak my, uh, preach my first message and has been with me ever since. And one of the things that, that we've always had in our relationship is, is commitment language. We've never even, we've never even, talked about divorce or splitting up or any of those kind of things. We have always been very committed. And in all of our language that even through our tough times, we said, we're in this together. We're gonna to work through this. Even when we've had uh, not only difficult times in, in circumstances outside of ourselves, but even in those times when we've had our own uh, personal uh, challenges, it's never been a doubt in either one of our minds that we were committed. Now, exit language is often used when we talk about, I'm going to get a divorce or I'm out of here. Those kind of statements are not statements of commitment. We're creating exit language. Now, one of the first things I want to talk about is the fact that sometimes we use that kind of language because we don't know how to put our feelings into words. So one of the things that I ask people is when we when we use that kind of language, I'm out of here, I'm getting a divorce, I can't stand you. Um, what are we really, what are we really saying? And generally the words or the feelings behind that kind of language is I'm scared. I'm afraid you're going to leave me. I'm afraid I'm going to be alone. That's generally what we find when we get behind that kind of language. So use commitment language and ask yourself, what is behind the negative statements, the exit language? What are you really wanting to say? And being able to say that is very important. And I'm gonna to get to a little more of that here in a few moments. The second thing to helping a marriage stay together and thrive is having common goals and common values. Bible tells us not to be unequally yoked together for this very reason. Where we're not yoked together is where we can be divided. So common values are essential to the growth of any relationship. Now, 
there are some things that seems like we can't agree on. And sometimes we just have to agree to disagree and then find ways to move on in the relationship. Third point I want to make is supporting each other's personal goals. Yes, in every marriage, there are common goals, and then there are personal goals. Common goals are important, but supporting one another's personal goals promotes growth. Now, I remember when um, our girls were young teenagers, uh, I had an opportunity to go back to graduate school or go to graduate school. Um, and that was a personal goal. But we had family conversations about it. I remember sitting around the table with my wife and my two daughters, Kim and Pam, and telling them that I had an opportunity to go to graduate school. And I thought it was going to really enhance my ministry and my what I do. And, and um, we talked about the sacrifices that were going to have to be made because of the money that was going to have to be spent. And after the discussion, I even allowed everybody to vote on it. Now you might say, well, your, your daughters are not going to vote against you. Well, you don't know my daughters. <laughs> if, if they would have been against the sacrifices they were going to have to make, they would have voted against me. Now, when a personal goal is in conflict with the common goals, the personal goal needs to be reconsidered. If it doesn't fit in to enhancing the relationship in the family, then we might be looking at a rather selfish goal and it needs to be reconsidered. Now, that's the glue. Now let's talk about the DNA of a growing relationship. Your current relationship is the conception of your relationship story, what you believe you can have. However, you can go beyond your present state. See, relationships are kind of like climbing a mountain. You get to the peak and there's something on the other side. Well, whatever state you're in, in your relationship, there's more to it. There's something beyond the horizon. Um, you can't see it. You might even be afraid of it, maybe afraid to look. Sometimes people have said to me, our relationship is getting so good it's scaring me. Well, every counselor has probably had that said to them, but the fact is, we have to get beyond our comfort zone in our relationship if we want to grow. Now, that's the bottom line. If you're, not, if you're not able to get beyond your comfort zone, you're always going to sabotage what could be next. And that's what many couples do because they're afraid of the vulnerability. They're afraid of what might be next and afraid of being transparent with each other. Now, number two, to go beyond, you must be aware that you don't know what you don't know. So you must be open to the possibilities and be willing to continually progress forward into new territory with your partner. Sharon and I have done this on so many levels that, that we've just, <laughs> we've blown it out more times than one. Going beyond where we were. What's next? How much more can we experience together? How much more vulnerability can we have with each other? And each one of those steps requires vulnerability, transparency, trust, and the ability to not take your mate's issues or, or their emotions personal. Now, we deal with that a lot in our... Uh, uh, relationship coaching process. Now, the next thing is growth in your relationship requires developing a good, strong partnership and willingness to embrace the journey, the learning, and the adventure. Instead of seeking comfort, tradition, and familiarity, 
we must be willing to go beyond our comfort zone. Sounds like I'm repeating myself, doesn't it? Well, in that sense, I am. Getting beyond our comfort zones. Now, comfort's not a bad thing. We don't always want to live on the edge, but we don't need to be afraid of going to the edge. And traditions are important. I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't have traditions. I'm suggesting that our traditions should not imprison us, that we can go beyond them. Now, I remember uh, on our 50th wedding anniversary, we had a big party and uh, it was great. And people came in from all over to celebrate with us. And uh, that was awesome. That was in June. Um, then I told Sharon, I said, you know what? You have cooked Christmas dinners, Thanksgiving dinners for 50 years. We're going to do something different this year. So instead of having the big Christmas dinner, um, we told our kids, I want, we want you to have dinners with your families. And uh, we're going to have our own celebration this year. Now, Again, if you know my daughters, they're up for change, and, and they were good with that. So Sharon and I actually went to the Compass Room to downtown Hilton, I believe it is, Hilton or Hyatt. It's a restaurant that, that goes around in a circle. And um, we enjoyed a different kind of Christmas dinner. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't want to be with our kids any other time, but that's just something that we did breaking a tradition and uh, enjoying something outside of the norm. Now, the dream beyond happily ever after, that's the fantasy that comes with every uh, marriage ceremony, I suppose, they lived happily ever after. Well, the myth behind that is, it's not happily ever after, unless we choose to take steps to make it so. It's not something that just happens automatically. It, ha it has to be on purpose. We have to take steps of intentionality to make that happen. Um, each step forward allows you to see more possibilities. In that sense, there's no such thing as achieving a dream. You just achieved one part of it. If you quit dreaming, you quit growing. So keep having dreams about where you want your relationship to go. What a great time. And, and Sharon and I have done this from time to time. What a great time to sit down and say, what's next? What do we want our relationship to look like? And you can even create you a vision board of what you want it to look like and how you want to get through this period of time in your life. A number of years ago, I was um, doing some research and came across um, some work out of the University of Nebraska that, uh, that studied 2,000 families around the world. And what they were looking for was the common denominator of healthy couples. And uh, it was very insightful and very rich. And one of those components in that study was that couples, happily married couples, families, that one of the things that they had in common was a way to solve problems. Wow, what a concept. How do we solve problems in our relationship? Now, again, sometimes people never get them solved because they get caught up in the cycle of the same exit language, the same uh, blaming uh, mode, and just keep going around in a circle, having the same argument over whatever it is. And people I've worked with that have those kind of arguments generally can't even tell me what they were arguing about. So having a way to solve problems. How are we going to work through this? A pre-planned, think about that, a pre-planned. We, we did that in school. We had fire drills. How are we going to get out of this building if there's a fire drill, if there's a fire? 
So we had fire drills. We practiced how we were going to get out of the problem. So we need to have a problem solving strategy because problems gets in the way of your vision and where you want to go. Now, the next step, the next one I want to give you is very important. If you've heard me talk about relationships at all, you've heard me talk about this. To take your relationship to another level requires a leap of faith and a willingness to embrace the unknown coupled with the need to take responsibility for your own emotions. <laughs> I asked a couple that I was working with and they were, they were heated. Um, and and they, were, they were having one of those cyclatory arguments that they couldn't even remember what they were arguing about. And um, he kept telling, the man kept, the husband kept telling me, she makes me, she doesn't respect me. She, do, she makes me so angry. And I said to him, what would it be like if you took responsibility for your own emotions instead of blaming your wife? He sat back in his chair and he said, Oh, well, if I did that, I couldn't blame my wife for how I'm feeling. <laughs> we actually all had a good chuckle out of that. And he was able to change some of the things that uh, he'd been doing. And he was able to enhance their relationship. So I want to challenge you in this time that we are closed in with each other to focus on taking your relationship to another level. Get out of the cyclatory exit language, if that's where you are, and embrace the unknown. See, too many people are just trying to survive their marriage. My goal is to help people thrive in their marriage. So I hope you'll take these eight components that I've given you and put them to work. Here's what I can tell you at this point. My 56 years of marriage has taught us this. Your relationship can be your greatest adventure. God bless you. We'll talk to you soon.